Amanda, when we start, the participants' lines will be muted until they uh, until we unmute them. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Okay. I'm here. Welcome, everyone. I want to thank you for joining us this evening for this important webinar entitled Wishes and Values at Life's End, Planning for the Care You Want and Deserve. This webinar Hi, I'm not, I'm not sure if uh, I just was muted and unmuted. Hold on one second. Okay. I just want to thank everyone for joining us tonight for this important webinar uh, entitled Wishes and Values at, Life End, at Life's End, Planning for the Care You Want and Deserve. This webinar is brought to you this evening by Compassion and Choices New York. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for joining. The presentation this evening will be in three parts with a short introduction. There is a lot of material here and I'll likely not be able to cover it all in as much detail as you may want. But I hope this webinar makes you aware of the importance of having conversations with your healthcare providers and your loved ones about your wishes and values when facing a critical illness and the resources that Compassion and Choices can be for you as you think through these issues. If there's something that I move too quickly through and you want to learn more, you can always consult our website or contact us afterwards. I'm going to pause briefly after each section to ask if there are questions. Now, the way we ask questions during this type of a webinar is that you have to type your question in the right hand side of your screen in the comments bar. I want to take a moment here to thank Amanda Cavanaugh, Compassion and Choices New York's organizer, who's on the phone tonight and helping with the technology that makes this kind of webinar possible. Amanda, do I have that right, that everyone uh, who wants to ask a question does so in the comment bar on the right-hand side of their screen? Yeah, there's actually um, a chat box, and you're able to type your message into that. So just look for the blue area that says chat and click on there, and you're able to type any message in the box. Fantastic. So uh, if you, we'll stop periodically to, to see if there are questions, and Amanda will help with that. But also remember, if you don't get a chance to ask a question, you can always contact us afterwards. So let's get started. This is our agenda for this evening. Um, first, I'm going to do a brief introduction, and then in part one, we're going to talk about early planning for life's end. In part two, we'll be talking about decisions that need to be made when you're facing a serious diagnosis. Part three, we'll deal with the tough questions about when the end is near, what options are available in New York State. And finally, we'll talk about how we can safeguard our wishes once we've made them known. Some of you may know the name Atul Gawande. He's the author of the best-selling book, Being Mortal, and many essays in The New Yorker magazine and The New York Times. This book has been read by many book clubs, and uh, many of you may, may have read it yourselves. Gawande is responsible for what I think has really been the beginning of a revolution in this country in helping us talk about end-of-life issues. I think this quote is really poignant uh, and, and a good way to start this webinar. Life is meaningful because it's a story, and in stories, endings matter. Um, during this webinar, and after we've ended tonight, I want you to think about some of the questions that you may have about end-of-life care. What are some of the experiences that shape your feelings about death and dying? Have you experienced the death of a loved one that was painful? If so, ask yourself what made it painful? Have you experienced a peaceful passing of a loved one? 
And then again, think about what made that passing peaceful. And finally, I want you to begin thinking about what questions you have about the healthcare you or a loved one might need or receive at the end of life. And what fears do you have about you or a loved one receiving a terminal diagnosis? Hopefully these questions will help you answer some of the questions you'll need to face when making a plan for yourself or helping a loved one make a plan about the care that you or they wanna receive in the face of a serious illness. Dying is something that all of us experience. Some of us grow old and die surrounded by loved ones and others' lives are cruelly cut short. According to a study published in the Journal of, American, of the American Society on Aging, here's what most people think of as a peaceful death. To be at home with loved ones, to have their pain and discomfort managed, to have their spiritual needs and values respected, and without being a devastating burden on loved ones. The way that we die really shapes whether we can realize the goals of a peaceful death. When you ask most people how they actually want to die, it's a difficult question to face, but when we do, most people will say quickly, in their sleep, without pain. Some may even say having sex, but upon reflection, if you think about it, that may not be so great for your partner. But anyway, back to the most common ways that people describe quickly in our sleep and without pain. Unfortunately, data from a 2012 CDC report shows that most of us will die from a terminal illness. Here on this slide, you'll see the major categories of causes of death. In a large number of these cases, the dying process is bound to be prolonged with lots of stages of decision-making opportunities and changes in quality of life and time for our priorities to change. The point is, most of us will not die suddenly or in our sleep. From the time of initial diagnosis to the time of death, many decisions will have to be made about the levels of care that we want. At times when we may or may not be capable of making our own decisions. So how do we ensure that at every stage we're getting the care that we want? And most relevant to tonight's webinar, what can you do now to ensure that you get the care that you want and deserve at the end of life? even if you become incapacitated and unable to voice your wishes. In the next part of this presentation, part one, I'm going to talk to you about the kinds of advanced planning that all adults can do now to plan for the care that we want in the future. Before we start though, I wanna share a few statistics. Did you know that two thirds of American adults have not completed an advanced directive? Catherine Courtright, an instructor at the University of Pennsylvania's Palliative and Advanced Illness Research Center says, the treatments most Americans would choose near the end of their lives are often very different from the treatments they receive. People have a lot of reasons for not completing their advanced planning documents, but it usually comes down to a combination of procrastination and not wanting to talk about death or the what ifs. Some people say, I don't wanna talk about death, I'm too young, or I'm not interested in dying, I'm trying too hard to continue living. Some may say God will take care of me. Others say that the forms are too complicated to fill out, or my son, my daughter, my spouse knows what to do. But it's really important, as we'll see through the rest of this webinar, that people have conversations to make sure that their loved ones know and to also leave written wishes about the care that they wanna to receive to relieve that burden on their loved ones. Now, it's said that death is the great equalizer. No one escapes it. Death comes for everyone. We know, however, that even in death, we're not equal. Death comes too soon for those without access to quality, affordable health care but there are even great disparities in how we experience death and dying. This slide shows a few of those disparities. Compared to 67% of white people in the United States who have an advanced directive, only 36% of African Americans do. The vast majority of those who take advantage of hospice care are white, and African Americans are far more likely to have their pain underestimated, undertreated, and less likely to receive adequate pain medication. One thing we know is that if we don't make our wishes known, others are making decisions for us about our care. 
advanced care planning is particularly important to those who can expect to experience discrimination in the healthcare system. Before we move on to the next piece, I want you to think about this question. Do your loved ones know what makes life worth living for you? It's really critical to think about, prepare for, and communicate your end of life preferences. And all of the information that I'm about to share is covered in greater detail in Compassion and Choices Good to Go resource guide and toolkit. And I'm gonna talk to you about how to access those. So let's dig in. <clears throat> Dying is something that all of us experience. Um, for some of us, it may seem too soon or too morbid to begin planning for the care we want at the end, but we all know that tragedy can strike at any time. Decisions about the kind of care we want shouldn't be made at the hospital when dealing with the trauma of a medical emergency. Anyone who's over 18 should really have some kind of a plan for what kind of care they want should they be unable to voice their preferences. So what can we all do now to ensure that we get the care that we want and deserve at the end of life, even if we become incapacitated and unable to voice our wishes? In this section, we'll learn what tools are available in New York that can help us plan for the care we want at the end of life. There are a number of different legal documents in New York State that one can use to make sure that those caring for you in a medical emergency understand what your wishes are. I'm gonna go over three different types of advanced directives here in New York, a living will, a healthcare proxy designation, and a do not resuscitate order, otherwise known as a DNR. There's also a medical document that you complete with your doctor called a medical order for life-sustaining treatment. In some states, it's called a POLST or physician order for life-sustaining treatment form. Let's talk about what each of these documents does and whether and when you should consider completing them. Let's first turn to the kinds of advanced directives that are available here in New York State. First, a living will. A living will allows you to leave written instructions that explain your healthcare wishes, especially about end of life care. The document should not be confused with a last will and testament, a document that outlines how your financial matters and assets are to be handled upon your death. The living will is your written instruction regarding the type of medical treatment you want or don't want in the event that you're no longer able to make these decisions on your own. Your living will does not have to be witnessed, but I recommend that you have two or more witnesses sign a written declaration. You cannot use a living will to name a healthcare agent. You must use the second document that we'll talk about, a healthcare proxy designation. A healthcare proxy designation lets you appoint a healthcare agent, that is, someone that you trust to make healthcare decisions for you if you're unable to make them yourself. The healthcare proxy takes effect only after two doctors decide that you're not able to make your own decisions. It allows the person that you've designated as a proxy to make decisions about all different types of care, including artificial nutrition and hydration, for example, the use of a tube to give you food and water if you've communicated those wishes to him or her. Your agent will also have the authority to decide whether or not your heartbeat should be restarted through cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, unless you, sort of, unless you specify in your healthcare proxy form that your agent cannot make this decision for you. You can either tell your agent uh, what kinds of care you want and don't want, or you can write about your wishes in your healthcare proxy form. Once your agent's authority begins, he or she has the right to get your medical information and records to make informed healthcare decisions for you. Your agent's decision is final unless an objecting family member or facility obtains a court order overriding the decision or disqualifying the agent. One thing that's important to note is that your agent is not financially responsible for the cost of your care. Overall, your agent is required to make healthcare decisions for you according to your, your wishes, your religious and moral beliefs, and those that are in your best interest. That's why it's so important to have conversations with those you love and particularly with the person you choose to be your healthcare proxy. These decisions are sometimes not cut and dry. It's important for your proxy to understand what your values are in order to make some of those decisions. 
You can make it easier if you complete both documents, appoint a healthcare proxy, but also create a living will. Many of you may recall the name Terry Schiavo. She was a woman in her mid-20s who collapsed and stopped breathing. Although she was revived, her brain had been deprived of oxygen, rendering her in what they called at that point a persistent vegetative state. In order for her to remain biologically alive, she had to be fed through a feeding tube. Her husband claimed she wouldn't want to be kept alive in this state, while her parents argued that she would want to be kept alive no matter what. Because she had never stated her own wishes in writing, her case went through the legal system for seven years before the court ultimately gave her husband the right to discontinue her artificial feeding tube. Because she never put her wishes in writing to this day, we don't actually know what her choice would have been. We recommend that you ensure your choices are honored by completing both of these forms. Finally, I want to talk about a do not resuscitate order or a DNR. A DNR tells healthcare professionals and emergency workers not to revive you if you stop breathing or your heart stops beating. It takes effect when it's signed by your doctor. There is no standard New York State form. Most hospitals have their own forms. And anyone not in a hospital can use a non-hospital order not to resuscitate. If someone is too sick to agree to a DNR, a healthcare agent or a closest family member can agree. And you can also write DNR instructions on your healthcare proxy form or living will, but the DNR form itself is the most effective. A DNR is not for everyone. It is for someone who is close to the end of life, a person whose quality of life is so low that it's not worth the pain of being resuscitated, the discomfort and indignity associated with coding and ventilation. It's also implicit that whatever medical emergency arises that may require CPR, usually a heart or a lung problem, will quickly, will quickly prove fatal. But a DNR is not for someone who is otherwise healthy and not facing end of life or debilitating uh, terminal illnesses. You would want, most of us, all of us, I, I would imagine, would want to be resuscitated uh, if a temporary medical emergency rendered us unable to breathe on our own. What's interesting is that doctors themselves are more likely to have DNR orders than those outside of the medical profession. They realize what many people do not, that especially for people who are elderly, sick, or frail, life-saving care can be painful and debilitating in and of itself. It can lead to brain damage and other serious health complications. If you do undergo extreme life-saving measures, it can be painful and traumatizing. For older and fragile older adults, broken ribs are not unusual uh, as a result of chest compressions. The point is that the DNR is not uh, something that is in place of other written uh, advanced directives, and it may not be for everyone. Earlier, when we talked about what happens to someone if they don't have written uh, directions in effect, um, that Terry Schiavo's case happened before the Family Health Care Decision Act was passed in, in New York. Um, before 2010, when this act was passed, it was unclear who could make the decision for a person, uh, a spouse, a child, a friend, wasn't able to make a decision for someone who couldn't communicate their own wishes absent a legal document. But the Family Health Care Decisions Act now sets forth a surrogate if one is not already chosen through a health care proxy. It sets forth an order of priority the people who may act as a surrogate decision maker for the incapable patient. It grants surrogate authority to make all health care decisions for the patient that the adult patient could make for him or herself subject to certain standards and limitations. So the order of priority, as you'll see here, is a court-appointed guardian, if there is one, a spouse or a domestic partner, an adult child, a parent, a brother or sister, or a close friend. Passed by the legislature in 2010, the Family Health Care Decisions Act establishes the authority of this list of people to make medical treatment decisions for the patient if the patient lacks capacity to make those decisions perfectly or didn't personally and didn't previously make such decisions or appoint a healthcare agent. 
I want to just uh, show you this resource that is really fantastic. The New York State Office of the Attorney General put out a document called Making Your Wishes Known and Honored. Uh, Compassion and Choice is links to this document on our website because it contains all of the forms and guidance that you may need in uh, completing documents to make your healthcare wishes known. You'll see here that the booklet includes a healthcare proxy form um, and also instructions for a wallet card. Uh, many people will ask, well, if I fill out all of these documents, how are people gonna know that I actually have them in the event of an emergency? Well, this handy wallet card you can fill out uh, and put in your wallet and carry it with you at all times to let people know that of the existence of advanced planning documents. The Attorney General's resource also has uh, a New York living will form. You can see that here, and it has places for witnesses to sign and for a notary to put their seal. And it also has a copy of the medical order for life-sustaining treatment. So I really encourage you, if these are documents that you feel motivated to, to fill out, if you haven't already done so after this webinar, um, you can consult our website for sure, and I'm going to go through that next. But I wanted to let you know about this resource from the New York State Attorney General. So let's take a look at resources from Compassion and Choices. We have a whole host of online tools in print to help you plan for the care that you want and make your wishes known. Um, but these are also available online. And the resource that I wanna highlight first is what we call the Good to Go Toolkit. With a number of online materials, the kit is designed to guide the process of making and communicating your decisions. These tools encourage conversations with your loved ones and your physicians that are essential in communicating your wishes. It helps you document your decisions uh, and the people that you want to support you and records those wishes. These resources can be found on our website here at www.compassionandchoices.org slash EOLC. In the next few slides, we're going to talk about some of these materials that you'll find in the Good to Go Toolkit. These include the values worksheet, a planning tool called My Particular Wishes, the dementia provision, and a few other tools available on the website. I am going to stop here and ask Amanda if we have any questions at this point. I do not see any questions in the chat box, but remember, folks, if you do have questions, there is an area to type those in on the right-hand side of your screen under the chat button. Okay, <clears throat> so we'll just move on. Um, first, let's talk about the values worksheet. The values worksheet that can be found on our website is helpful in, en in end of life planning and it, as it makes you think about those issues that are most important to you. For example, are you more concerned about your quality of life or your longevity? Are you concerned about being mentally alert to the end, staying true to your spiritual beliefs and traditions? This tool on our website will help you get, help guide you through those decisions. Weighing these questions can help in determining such things as whether you would want CPR or life-sustaining treatment in the event that you stop breathing. The next tool is called My Particular Wishes, and it's a helpful one to promote conversations with your loved ones and medical providers. You can consider printing out this document and adding it directly to your advanced directives. It allows you to state whether you want certain types of treatment initiated, withheld, or used for a trial period, as specified by you, to determine if your condition will improve as the result of a specified treatment. This tool can also help you fill out your living will. The next tool I wanna to talk about is a really important one. Um, when we talk about advanced planning throughout the state, one of the, the big questions that we get from people is, is what can I do uh, to, you know, to deal with dementia and Alzheimer's? And Compassion and Choices has pioneered what's called the dementia provision. Uh, it is a document that you can add to your advanced directive. Um, it has to be completed while you're still lucid and able to clearly understand the nature of the request that you're making. The form is designed as a contingency in the event a person loses their cognitive abilities. 
and it's designed to instruct caregivers about the type of treatment a person wants or doesn't want if they're no longer mentally able to make those decisions. This form should be completed in connection with my particular wishes. In connection with these two documents, a person can specify in advance whether they want to be artificially fed, if they want antibiotics administered should they develop an infection, or if they want CPR if they stop breathing. We recently gave a presentation to a group in the capital region in New York State, and a woman raised her hand and said that uh, her mother several years ago had developed early onset dementia. Uh, her mother had watched uh, her father struggle with this illness, and she also cared for her husband through many years of Alzheimer's. So her mother, she knew, uh, didn't want to linger long with dementia like her husband and her father had. Well, her mother experienced a medical emergency and a treatable medical emergency and went into the hospital and developed a, a hospital-borne infection. Uh, it was a, a urinary tract infection. And the doctor called this daughter in and said, your mother has a provision in her living will that says that she doesn't want antibiotics administered. Do you know what that means? The daughter said, no, I don't know what that means. And the doctor said, if we don't administer the antibiotics, your mother will pass uh, relatively soon. The daughter said she felt like her mother had given her a gift, that she had included this provision in her will because she knew that she didn't want to linger and that this urinary tract infection that she developed in the hospital was a way for her to exit in the way that she wanted. So you can download the dementia provision from our website and add it to a living will uh, to, to make sure that you, um, that you don't receive care that, that you may not want at that stage in your life. I wanna point out just a few other resources that you'll find on this website. The first is a booklet called Your Life, Your Priorities, Options for Managing Your End-of-Life Decisions. It's a helpful guide to thinking through some of these questions. Um, there are some other concrete tools that you won't see on these slides, but there's a rider that you can download for a residential treatment agreement um, with an assisted living facility. It's a useful tool that you can add to an advanced directive, and it helps to ensure that an assisted living facility won't evict you for wanting to exercise your legal end-of-life options, such as in-home hospice care. Um, there's also a religion and conscientious refusal form that requests that you be transferred to another medical facility if the one that you're in currently refuses to honor otherwise legal medical treatment requests because of moral or religious objections on the part of the provider. This is a particularly important form at this at this time uh, in our in our in our country. <laughs> Uh, the next is a hospital visitation form. This is especially important for people who are not traditionally recognized as family members. And a letter that you can download to your healthcare provider. Um, lastly, sorry, there's one more. Uh, it is a tool that helps you interview a hospice. It gives you sample questions to ask to get the kind of care that you want. Um, Amanda, any questions to stop at here? Yes. Um, we have a question. Do you still need a DNR even if you have designated, a d even if you have a designated agent with a living will prepared by a New York State lawyer? The way to answer that is you can include a DNR in these other documents. Um, hospitals have their own DNRs, though, and it might be a good idea if you're actually in a facility to use the form that they recognize. Um, it's never a bad idea to document your wishes in multiple places. What you want to be careful of is not contradicting yourself. You want to make sure that if you fill out a separate DNR and there are DNR instructions in a living will, that they're consistent with one another. Um, that would be the only caution. Great. And the other question is um, not knowing, you know, where you'll be in 10 or 20 years from now. Will my living will created in New York State be honored in our 49 other states or in a 40 or in a foreign country? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, what's really important is that you, I, I, I want to handle the first part, maybe an unspoken question in the first part, and that is that you should revisit these wishes frequently. 
If you move to another state, you ought to consult the resources available on that other state. On our website, um, I showed you that we link to the New York State Adjour Attorney General's resources. Um, but for each state in this country, we have links to the appropriate documents. So if you are thinking about relocating or moving to another state for six months out of the year, it's important for you to consult uh, the legal requirements in those states. That said, um, your living will, particularly if it is witnessed and notarized, should be proof of your uh, wishes and values at the end of life in another state. Uh, there may be legal requirements for other types of documents that uh, make it clearer to a healthcare provider or a court what you want, uh, but a witnessed living will should serve as guidance for healthcare providers in other states, even if you haven't filled out those forms. I can't speak to what would happen in, in another country. Any other questions, Amanda? Nope, that was it. Okay. The single most powerful thing that a person can do to improve the chance of dying in the manner that you want is to talk about it. And the greatest gift that you can give family and loved ones is the knowledge that they don't have to make difficult choices for you, that you've already made them and relieve them of the burden of guessing what you might want. If ever they have to make decisions on your behalf, that difficult task is made easier by being confident that they know your wishes. You relieve them of the burden of guessing what you would want, and you make your preferences clear to everyone well ahead of a medical crisis. Your discussions should include feelings about how you would want to be treated in a variety of situations. Those close to you need to know what you would want to prioritize if you were living with physical pain, terminal illness, dementia, and a debilitating chronic illness. But how do you start those difficult conversations? And when do you have them? These are some of the ways that you can start conversations with loved ones. I'm not going to read through this entire screen, uh, but these are some of the opening statements that you can make to start the conversation with, with your loved ones. These conversations are really important because most of the time, we've only had them on the surface. You've heard people say, I don't want extraordinary care or heroic measures. I want X, Y, or Z if I'm in pain. I want this if I have no quality of life. Do this if there's no hope for recovery. But what does extraordinary mean? What was extraordinary only a few years ago may be commonplace today. Pacemakers were once extraordinary. Now they can almost be seen as routine. And what exactly does heroic measures mean? Pain is personal, subjective, and we all have different tolerance levels. Is pain a slight grimace or a scream of agony? And how does someone know how much pain you may be willing to tolerate? Who determines what quality of life you have if it isn't clearly communicated? And what does this mean to your healthcare agent? No hope of recovery is very tricky. Some doctors will say there is always a hope and miracles can happen. If the people that you're charging to make decisions with you or for you don't understand what your definition of hope is and what your understanding of a miracle is, they won't know how to make those decisions. You can fill out all of the paperwork that I've suggested, but with a conversation, uh, but without a conversation with your loved ones about what's important to you, there are likely going to be moments when your wishes are ambiguous and others will, put, will be put in a position of deciding for you. I have spoken a lot about talking to your family and your loved ones, but for many people, this may not be so easy. By 2050, the number of people who will be 65 or older is projected to be 83.7 million, almost double that of 2012. This group has experienced higher divorce rates and fewer children, which creates a group of individuals aging alone and needing assistance. 16% of critically ill patients in intensive care units have no one to speak for them. In these cases, there may be no family that ha to have the conversation with. It's important in those cases to choose with care a trusted healthcare proxy. For solo elders, possible proxies could be people who love you and who you trust, friends, an intentional community, or teaming up with others in group homes as co-advocates for care. It's important to choose a proxy 
who loves you more than they love your money and your possessions and to create a healthcare team that knows your wishes. In cases like this, to the extent possible, documenting those wishes with the advanced planning documents that I described will help everyone. Before I move on to part number two, uh, Amanda, I can't imagine we have another question, but I thought I'd check. We do not, go ahead. Okay. We dread the lab results that cause our doctor to ask us to come in instead of giving us the all clear by phone. But what does it mean to get a terminal diagnosis? In this section, we'll explore some of the questions those hearing these words might have and how to decode a diagnosis and work with your medical team on a plan for care. Let's talk about some key terms first because the differences are significant. First, a serious or life-threatening illness is one that has a substantial impact on day-to-day -day functioning where there's a likelihood that if left untreated, it will progress to a more serious one with a potentially fatal outcome. A terminal illness is an incurable and irreversible illness or condition or disease that cannot be adequately treated and is reasonably expected to result in the death of the patient within a short period of time. And a prognosis is a doctor's judgment of the likely or expected development of disease, a statement of what the likely future, future situation might be. Now that we're clear what we're talking about, I wanna tell you about an exciting new set of tools that Compassionate Choices has developed to help navigate the choices that those dealing with serious illness are, caused on to, are, are called on to make. Truth and Treatment is a new initiative from, a new initiative from Compassionate Choices. If you're diagnosed with a life-threatening illness, or confronted with a progressive illness, this is the moment when you're forced to think about the care you want now. This is the time when you need to weigh the benefits and burdens of proposed tests and treatment in light of how advanced your illness is and against your values and priorities. By using these tools, you'll be better equipped to work with your doctors and make fully informed treatment decisions. Why is it important to think about these things? A few statistics to contemplate. According to a 2016 cancer care report, one in three cancer patients say that they're getting enough information about other options for treatment. One in three people near the end of their lives receive non-beneficial treatment. In other words, treatment given with little or no hope of it having any effect. And three in four younger cancer patients with a documented preference for just comfort care get at least one form of intensive end of life care, such as chemotherapy in their last month. So what is truth and treatment? This initiative gives people with life-threatening life illness the support, opportunity, and courage to live life full of, to its fullest, even as illness advances. It's a set of online tools that offers, offers you the, the opportunity to live your life on your own terms. The tool was designed to put the patient in the driver's seat of care so that that patient can align the care with their own values and priorities. We hope it inspires people to be true to themselves, even when they're at their most vulnerable. The tool is designed to help shift your expectations and help you feel empowered so that when you receive care, that it's consistent with your values and priorities. It's about how you want to live, not how you want to die. On the Truth and Treatment website, you can view, tailor, and download questions to bring with you to the doctor. You can watch videos about how patients ask questions of their providers. You can find some tips to help maximize your time at the doctor's office. You can find five questions to ask yourself about your own priorities, and you can gain access to tools to help, to help evaluate your options. To learn more about Truth and Treatment, you can visit our website at www.truthandtreatment.org. The first tool that Compassion and Choices released was called the Trust Card. It's a simple, customized greeting card that's designed to help build a trusting relationship between a patient and her doctor. A person can use it to clearly convey their wishes to their doctor in a respectful and friendly manner. While docs, doctors are the experts on medicine, you are the expert on you. The tool lets doctors know from the outset 
that you'll be fully engaged in making decisions about your own treatment. How it works is you go to the trust card website and answer three short questions. How do you want the trust card to help you and your doctor? Which best describes how you want information about any diagnosis or treatment options? And what do you want the doctor or specialist to know about you? Based on your answers to these questions, customized messages are printed on the inside of the card. If you want full candor from your doctor, one message might read, I can handle the truth. You can be frank with me. Share the results of every test. I understand that medicine is complex, but I listen carefully. So please share everything you know, even the complicated stuff, and even when it's hard for me to hear. Let's decide things together. If you prefer a little more hand-holding, a message may read, I ask that you be considerate of my feelings, but it's important that you're also frank and honest. You can bring the trust card to your doctor's appointment to create an opening in a conversation. Reading these messages can help a doctor better understand how to communicate with you. The website instructs you on how to obtain one of these cards. Compassion and Choices released its second tool, the Diagnosis Decoder, last year. With the pressures of fitting everything into a 15-minute appointment, this online tool helps people navigate conversations with a doctor. Asking the right questions gives doctors permission to talk about the benefits and burdens of different treatments and to outline all of the options. When you're armed with better questions, you can receive better information and make fully informed treatment decisions. With the clear information in mind and in hand, you can demand a treatment plan that aligns with your values and priorities. Doctors have told us, when a patient asks me questions that got to the heart of their values, I started seeing my other patients as more than just their diagnoses. When you use the diagnosis decoder, you can choose from a variety of questions that might help you plan your care. I'll give you just a few examples of the questions you can find on the website. You can download these or have them emailed to you from this web-based tool. The questions are something like, what are my treatment options from the most aggressive to the most conservative? Is the decision urgent or can I take some time to decide? How would your recommendation change if I tell you my priority is either finding a cure or receiving comfort care? How will my disease affect my body and my daily quality of life? And what are the chances that this treatment that you're recommending will harm me? All of these questions are tailored based on what you, what you enter into the website. Um, and these are questions that you can download and bring to your, to your doctor's appointment to help guide the conversation. I hope you can take the time to explore these online tools after the webinar and let us know if you find them useful. Amanda, I think I'm going to stop here and ask if there are any questions. There are not. <clears throat> so let's move to part three, the last part of this webinar, when the end is near. If there's one thing we all have in common, it's that we're not leaving this world alive. At some point, after even the most aggressive and state-of-the-art treatment, our options will run their course. And you may hear the phrase, there's nothing more we can do. That's not entirely true. Do you remember at the beginning of the webinar when I shared with you Dr. Gawande's quote that endings matter? For far too long, the end of curative treatment was the end of the story. But today, we know that there are choices to be made even in this very last chapter of our lives. And there's a role for our healthcare providers to play. Let's take a look at what options exist for people at the end of their lives, options that allow people to make choices about how they live out their final days and ultimately how they die. <clears throat> First, let's take a look at what options are available in New York State. I'm going to go through these uh, one by one and then I'll go back and explain them. The first option is to receive all available medical treatments and interventions. The second is discontinuing or refusing medical treatment. The third, palliative care, including hospice services. The fourth is known as voluntarily stopping eating or drinking, otherwise known as VSED. The next is palliative sedation. 
These five options are all authorized in New York State, and as I said, we'll go through each of them. At the end, I'd like to mention one further option, and it's called Medical Aid in Dying. It's authorized in, in six states and Washington, D.C., but not in New York State, so we'll save that one for last. Whoops. Let's go back to all available medical treatments. Everyone has the right to seek all available medical treatments and interventions to the very end. Questions to ask yourself about this option are, what does this mean in the context of our current healthcare payment system? Does everyone have equal access to all available medical treatments and interventions? And sadly, we know the answer to that question is no. But other questions are, can aggressive treatments affect the length and the quality of my life? And how will I know when enough is enough? These are all complicating factors when thinking about the decision to avail yourself of all available medical treatments and interventions. The next option is discontinuing or refusing medical treatment. Everyone has the right to discontinue or refuse medical treatment at any time. When someone has had enough, he or she may say to her doctor, I don't wanna receive any more treatment. Even life-sustaining treatment, a ventilator, a feeding tube, IV hydration, antibiotics, CPR, all of these can be refused or stopped at any time. This decision can also be made by proxy through an advanced care directive. In consultation with their doctor, people must determine whether more treatment is helpful or whether it will prolong the dying process and increase suffering without improving quality of life. Those in a care facility may need to work closely with staff to ensure that they'll honor these choices. Discontinuing treatment doesn't necessarily mean that death will result right away. In fact, for many people, death may come only after a protracted dying process after treatment has been stopped. Between the time the treatment is stopped and a person passes, there are other options that can ease an inevitable dying process. The first I'm going to talk about is palliative care. At any time that someone is receiving care or when they decide to discontinue care, there is an option to receive palliative care. Sometimes referred to as comfort care, palliative care is a specialized approach to the treatment of patients with a serious or life-threatening illness. The goal of palliative care is to provide relief from symptoms, pain, and stress of serious illness. While palliative care can be provided alongside curative treatment, its goal is different, and that goal is to provide pain and symptom management. It can involve the use of medications, but also alternative therapies like massage, acupuncture, ar aromatherapy, uh, all, of, all of those treatments that can bring comfort. One palliative care option available to those who have a terminal prognosis, and one that in many cases is re restricted to those who choose to forego curative treatment, is called hospice. Hospice is a specialized type of care for those facing life-limiting illnesses, their families, and their caregivers. It involves a team of professionals working with a patient in their own home or in a home-like setting concentrating on managing a patient's pain and other symptoms so that the patient may live as comfortably as possible and make the most of what time remains. It addresses the patient's physical, emotional, social, and spiritual needs. Just as important as helping the dying person, hospice also helps the patient's family caregivers. One philosophy of hospice is that the quality of life is prioritized as important as the length of life. For some patients with certain kinds of diseases like cancer, those who are receiving hospice and palliative care need to take additional steps to relieve prolonged suffering endured as part of the dying process. There are two additional options that are available in New York State in those cases, and I'll talk about each in turn. The first is voluntarily stopping eating and drinking a process often known as VSED. VSED is a conscious decision to refu refuse foods and fluids of any kind, including artificial nutrition and hydration. This option can be chosen by a decisionally capable adult 
who has the ability to eat and drink but refuses to advance the time of death. It's a legal option anywhere in the United States. The US Supreme Court has affirmed the right of a mentally capable individual to refuse medical therapies, including food and fluids. VSED can be sought at home or in a care facility, but should be medically managed to minimize discomfort. It's not an easy option, stopping eating and drinking. It can be difficult for a family and for an individual, even though for some who are dying, a loss of appetite and a desire to seek hydration is normal. Discomfort from withholding food and drink for some only lasts a day or two. For others, it can be quite uncomfortable and disorienting. A determined and well-informed individual with significant caregiving and hospice support can successfully choose this end-of-life option. For some, VSET is a choice that can result in a peaceful death. For others, it's not a peaceful option. That's why the last option that I'll talk about that's authorized in New York State is called palliative sedation. Sometimes called terminal sedation, it involves being medicated to reduce consciousness. Palliative sedation is an end-of-life option that is practiced in rare circumstances. Typically, the person remains unconscious until death. At the same time, all nutrition and fluids are stopped. Sedation may bring some relief for extreme pain and suffering. However, it may not totally relieve symptoms. Providers have described the process as something more akin to art than science. Give too much medication and you cause death, which is not allowed. Give too little and the person may suffer. These are the five options that people who are dying in New York State currently have. For some people who are dying, these five options are not enough. And that's why the last option we'll talk about this evening is medical aid in dying. Medical aid in dying is a medical practice in which a terminally ill, mentally capable adult with a prognosis of six months or less may request from their doctor a prescription for medication that they can choose to self-administer to bring about a peaceful death. Physicians in six states and Washington, D.C. now allow dying people access to this end-of-life option. Doctors have the benefit of clinical practice guidelines that were published in the Journal of Palliative Medicine in 2015 to guide their practice. Medical aid in dying is authorized in seven jurisdictions, either through statute or court decision, including Oregon, which passed the law in 1994, but it went in through ba a ballot initiative, but it went into effect in 1997. Washington adopted a, this practice in 2008 through a ballot initiative. The Montana State Supreme Court gave people the right to medical aid in dying in 2009. The Vermont legislature allowed this option for, for dying patients in 2013. California's legislature passed it in 2015, and Colorado gave its citizens the right to medical aid in dying through a ballot initiative in 2016. And then in Washington, D.C., the city council approved the measure and the mayor signed it into law, in two, and it went into effect in 2017. Legislation is currently be, being considered in, a, in, in multiple states, including, including New York. The number of professional medical associations that have endorsed the practice across the country has grown in the past years and now includes, among others, the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, the American Public Health Association, the American Medical Women's Association, and the American College of Legal Medicine. There is legislation pending in New York State that would authorize medical aid in dying, and it's called the Medical Aid in Dying Act. If you're interested in learning more, I would encourage you to visit our website at www.compassionandchoices.org backslash new dash York. I'm gonna to turn to the last part of our webinar this evening and that is safeguarding your wishes and values. While completing end of life documents is essential, there are no 100% guarantees that your wishes will be followed. You can improve your chances of your wishes driving the health care that you receive at the end of your life by taking a few small steps now. Have candid conversations with your family and your loved ones, your health care provider, 
and the person you've chosen as your proxy. Review, initial, and date your documents annually or whenever you change your mind. Appoint a reliable healthcare proxy. This doesn't have to be the person closest to you, and sometimes it shouldn't be. This should be someone you trust to carry out your wishes. It might be too hard for the person who's closest to you. Make sure that people know where your documents are. Placing your living will in a safe renders it useless in an emergency, unless someone knows where to find it and can get to it. And make sure you give copies to loved ones and caretakers. You can ask the doctor to put your documents in your file or make a note of their existence and who to ask for them. Keep a list of everyone who has copies in case they need to be changed. Keep a copy of your healthcare proxy and directions about where to find your living will in your wallet. You can go to our Good to Go toolkit or you can use that handy cutout from the New York State Attorney General's website. And discuss your treatment wishes with your doctor. That concludes the information that I wanted to present to you tonight. Um, Amanda, I wonder if there are any questions that we can answer before we wrap up this evening. There are not any questions in the box. However, I'm going to unmute everyone. And if you do have a question, we'll try to take those one at a time. Eleanor? Where does morphine fit into steps five or six? No, stop talking. Steps five or six being five as terminal sedation and six yes, yes, and and um, medical and medical uh, aid to dying. Where does morphine fit in? Well, morphine is not the drug that is used in medical aid and dying, and often it's 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 also not the drug that they use for terminal sedation. Um, many people who've been receiving, uh, you know, pain management for a long period of time. Uh, develop a tolerance to drugs like morphine, and so there are other drugs that are that are used. But people do have a right in New York State to receive adequate uh, pain care. What we do know is that because of the opioid crisis, some people uh, uh, are experiencing a denial of adequate pain medication, and we urge you to contact, uh, you know, speak with your healthcare provider and contact someone for help if that's the case. Okay, thank you. Amanda, other questions? Eleanor, did you want to ask your question? Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, I was trying to, and I didn't realize that you had muted me. Um, I know that Compassion and Choices is working very hard for the legal option, um, but there is an organization that uh, takes things um, into its own hands and provides people with the means to self-deliver when uh, all other options, you know, do not seem to address the needs, and that's final exit. I'm I'm active in compassion and choices, but I'm also a member of final exit. Yeah. There, there are a number of organizations out there that provide that provide resources for um, different end of life care, and I encourage people to do research and find what's right for you. Uh, Compassion and Choices has a wealth of resources on our website, but there may be other resources that you'll want to consult. So, thank you, Eleanor. Yeah, uh, yeah and and last year, my my daughter-in-law was uh, in in a hospital in Schenectady, and. Um, she was seriously ill, and she signed a DNR and was then put in, uh, I guess, the the the, um, the hospice wing of the hospital. But they really did not give her adequate med medication. She she was in a quasi agitated state for three and a half days. Oh, and I, I'm so I sorry. I'm so sorry to hear that. Hello. I'm so sorry to hear that, Eleanor. That's that's a terrible uh, situation. It, it's terrible because you know I was there and I was you know able to argue cogently for more and and nothing would move them. They would not increase her medication. That's why it's so important for us to talk to healthcare providers before an emergency strikes. There's never a hundred percent guarantee uh, that we'll receive the kind of care that we want. But there's a lot we can do in the meantime to plan for that and, and lessen the chances uh, that we'll experience that kind of care at the end of life. So I'm, I'm sorry for that, for that experience that you had. 
So, Corinne, we have a, a typed-in question. Will the dementia provision form be honored in New York State if signed and dated while still able to make decisions? It should be. That's what it's designed for. Others have reported that it's been effective. Again, we can't guarantee 100% that providers are going to respect your wishes in the same way that we can't guarantee that people violate the law. Um, but it is a form that is recognized in New York, and it has been used by others. So I would encourage you to download it, take a look at it, um, fill it out, add it to your living will, and if you've got an attorney to consult with, um, make sure that they, that they review the form as well. Okay, I don't think we have any questions. I, I would just like to add, you know, with the increasing consolidation of hospitals and uh, healthcare facilities, a lot of hospitals are now under the um, control of, of the Roman Catholic organizations. And I think that there may be some um, resistance in those institutions to... Um, not being more proactive, I, that's just a feeling I have. Well, it's not just a feeling, it is a reality. It is something that we have to deal with as a society and it's not, it's not getting better in terms of uh, expanding people's choice anytime soon. Uh, but there are things that you can do to, to make sure that you're in the right facility that will respect your wishes. I'm losing you. Yeah, I, I think that we're, you know, because we unmuted all the lines, we're, we're getting some static. But it is okay. 8 o'clock, and I am going to say thank you to everyone for joining. Thank you for your good questions. And you can always contact me or consult the, the website, www.compassionandchoices.org slash EOLC in the future. I hope you found this helpful, and have a good evening. Thank you, thank you very much.